So I've been uh, looking at this um, agenda here. What am I seeing? The program. Apparently it says something about um, keynote address, how I sold my company and bought it back. Yeah, well, well, it's really about how I sold my company, made a lot of mistakes, bought my company back, made more mistakes, but, you know, we're still having fun and we're here with Flume in the top five of iTunes across all of Europe today, so we're still going, but mistakes is what we're going to talk about. So the best part of what I do is working with incredible people at incredible labels, including our own, and they're here. They share with PS two common themes. One, they push boundaries and innovate. Two, they take risks. And like any label that takes risks, occasionally mistakes can be made. But there are usually mistakes be made in the pursuit of excellence. I would like today to tell a story about how to learn from one's mistakes. Anyone who says they have never made a mistake is deluded, and I'm happy to hold my hands up and say that I have made plenty of mistakes in my life and in my career. I think I've also made some pretty good decisions, but I believe it's our mistakes and how we respond to them that truly shape our character. So let's start at the beginning. Almost 20 years ago, my partner, Michel Lambeau, and I sold our company. This in itself wasn't a mistake, far from it. I don't regret it for a moment. Well, I, I don't really regret it. But how we handled ourselves after we sold it, well, that's looking that needs looking at, and that's what we're going to do today. At the time, it looked like a great business decision. We were offered a lot of money and the creative freedom and resources to build on our existing success. What possibly could go wrong? Well, this is not just a story about what we did, it's also about what we learned. So, let me set the scene. In 96, our company, Pias, which we had started in 1982, was doing pretty well. 14 years after we had launched it in Brussels, we had a relatively successful operation. We had a solid business working with all the top independent labels of the day. We had just opened an office in France. We were trying to expand further internationally, but were frustrated at a lack of funds and our inability to compete with the majors. We were finding it increasingly difficult to sign the artists and labels we wanted to work with and to keep hold of the talent we already had. One of the main territories we had struggled to gain a meaningful foothold in was Germany. We had a small office in Hamburg, but for one reason or another, we hadn't really been able to take an impact there. And given that it was one of the world's major music markets, well, this was an issue. And then, in 96, we were approached with Michael Henschers, the boss of Edel. Before I go on, I want to say the following. I want to make it very clear that although the ideas and dreams Michael had were ultimately doomed, he was a visionary, and I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. His plans didn't work out, but he had the guts to try. So, Michael approached me with an idea. He wanted to expand Edel's offering before the pop and jazz catalogs they were best known for. He knew Michel and myself wanted to create a bigger presence in Germany, so he suggested we launch a joint venture, an independent sales force in Germany. It made complete sense. He would provide the funding and the resources, and we would provide the expertise and content. Things moved very quickly after our initial discussions, and within eight weeks, we had hired 10 people, and our new company called Connected hit the ground running in 1997. And we got lucky. 
our first release by the Propeller Heads, was a top 10 hit. We were off to a good start. Connected was a success. Everyone involved got what they wanted out of it, and it quickly established it itself as a viable business, working with Mute, the Beggars Group, as well as a number of big local labels. Two years later, in 99, Michael Hentress announced out of the blue that Edel was going public. It was going to be listed on the German alternative investment market, the Neuer Markt. He had been approached by investors who wanted to buy into his company and who wanted to develop a successful music business using Michael and Edel as the hub through which to attract other acquisitions. The key to this master plan was scale. The investors wanted Michael to create scale fast, and the best way to do this quickly was to go on a buying spree. Edel had been valued at 27 times its profits, which by any standards was an impressive multiple. And Michael approached us at PS, offering the same multiple to buy PS. Michelle and I were quick to reject Michael's offer. It was good money, great money in fact, but we were not interested in selling. We felt we had a growing business with excellent prospects and above all attached a real premium on our independence after all. In 1999, we had sold three million Mr. Wazo flatbeat singles, half a million propeller heads. We were flying, but Michael was persistent. He laid out a plan that would allow us to keep our independence alongside creative and operational freedom while receiving the resources to grow the company. He didn't want to own us, he said. We were creative guys who understood our market better than anybody. Rather, he wanted to provide the funding and support to maximize the potential of PS. So, after much deliberation, we agreed to sell Michael 74.9% of the shares in PS while retaining 25.1%. The figure is significant because reta retaining over one quarter of the shares meant we received a lot of minority shareholder protection under Belgium company law. In return, Michel and I received a significant personal payment for our shares. And on top of that, we were given a 25 million euro war chest to grow the company. That's 25 million euros. We also both received a seat on the advisory board of the Edel parent company. So, a guarantee of autonomy, personal wealth, a big capital injection for the company, and a seat on the board of the parent company. Where's the catch, right? Where's the catch? I've got to admit, I thought it was the deal of a lifetime, and it probably was. Michelle and I promised each other we wouldn't get carried away. We would stick to our principles and not allow ourselves to get overwhelmed by the money or the expectation. It's worth mentioning at this point that while we were starting to get very excited about this proposition, not everybody working with us had bought into this idea. Our financial director at the time, Phil Sossi, a thoughtful, and professional guy had taken a look at the offer and raised concerns. His view was that the deal looked amazing, but it didn't reflect reality. How was this plan remotely workable? It didn't make financial or economic sense. Not one bit. Not one bit. Well, Michel and I politely listened to his concerns. We nodded along with his warnings and then completely ignored them. One of Edel's core strategies was to grow through acquisition, to create scale and market share in order to drive revenues for their shareholders. We were encouraged to take this money, this 25 million euros war chest, and spend it fast. 
Our instructions from Michael and the Edel board were sign bands, buy labels, grab content and IP wherever you can, grow the business. Edel wanted acquisitions and they wanted Piaz to start driving revenues through the group as soon as possible. They wanted us to start returning on investment. It's not an unreasonable request in a normal business. But as everyone in this room knows, we do not operate in a normal industry, not in a normal business. And suddenly, you know what? Suddenly, we had a lot of friends, a lot of new friends. Overnight, we were the guys looking for deals and with money to spend. So managers, lawyers, label owners, and anyone with anything to sell came calling. You've seen this phenomenon in football in recent years. Money has poured into the big leagues around Europe, and suddenly, the cost of talent has a massive premium attached to it. Suddenly, a player who was worth 15 million one week is suddenly going to cost 25 million because the buying club has had a big TV money windfall or a new Russian owner. We were those guys the guys with the cash, like Cobalt today. But before we even got to the deals we stuffed up, to cope with what we anticipated would be a flood of new signings and acquisitions, yes, we started hiring, and hiring good people is expensive. And then we did some deals. Oh boy, did we make some crazy deals. We paid advances to bands that even today make me squirm, and acquired labels for silly money. Some of Mitch might be in this room. Is Renat here? Maybe not. A lot of people made good money. So well, it's a joke, Renat, it's a joke. A lot of people made good money from our mistakes, yes. But it wasn't all bad, despite some of the bad business decisions, we do actually know what we're doing when it comes to talent. And in amongst the terrible deals, with some really good ones. We signed Sigaros, we signed Mogwai, Too Many DJs, Junior Jack, and others during that period. So it wasn't like we'd gone deaf. During this spending spree, we started to hear murmurs of disapproval from our friends and colleagues in the independent music community, that we were over-inflating the market and driving the prices of deals up. On reflection, this was true. We were overpaying and creating an unrealistic environment in which others were finding it hard to compete. In some ways, we were acting just like the major labels we had worked so hard to distance ourselves from philosophically. And then things, things started to go badly wrong. First of all, we ran out of money. In 18 months, we had managed to pretty much burn through our 25 million. And to make things even worse, Edel's share price had crashed and burned. From a high of 126 euros of shares, we're sitting at just two euros, and the grand vision of Michael Henschers and Edel was falling apart. As previously, as previously mentioned, Michelle and I sat on the advisory board of Edel. So we knew that the group was in trouble. Piaz was losing money, but the group was hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging cash. At this point, I want to say this. I believe Michelle and I, along with the team we had at the time, could have turned things around given more time. I genuinely believe this. We had some really great labels. We had some really great artists, albeit we may have overpaid for some of them. We also had some brilliantly talented staff, but the time frame we were given to develop these acquisitions into a profitable business simply wasn't long enough. It takes time to develop artists. It takes time for labels to grow and nurture their rosters. Something the stock exchange never, never understood. We tried to do things too quickly. We didn't allow time for our talent to breathe. Of course we failed. How could we not? And of course, eventually, we, get the call. we got the call from Michael. He sat us down, and he was honest with us. Things weren't going well. 
there needed to be a major restructuring of the group. We asked him if he wanted us out, expecting him to say yes, but his answer surprised. He didn't. Instead, he wanted to buy us out of our remaining 25.1% shareholding and fully integrate Pias in Edo. I say this with my hand on my heart. It took only one glance between Michel and myself before we said, no. I didn't want to be 38 years old, holding a big bag of cash, but essentially jobless. And Michel felt the same. By this point, we had been running PS for 16 years. We had built it from nothing, grown up with it. It was our life's work and a huge part of who we were. Selling that legacy on the back of what felt like a failure, no way, not a chance. That period had taken a big toll on both Michel and myself. We both suffered on a personal, uh, on a personal level. There were divorces, moments of depression, moments of great insecurity, too much drinking probably even, and overindulgence. It was a huge strain. In the last two years, PS has launched an online blog, The Independent Echo, the raison d'etre of which is to celebrate the independent community as a whole. As a contribution to this, I have interviewed a number of music industry icons who have, at some stage, sold the companies they built. People like Daniel Miller, Corder Marshall, Roger Ames, Chris Wright, and they all have the same thing in common, they kind of all regretted it. They regretted it because the music industry, for most of us who work in it, is not just a job. It is a privilege. So the dilemma you face when offered the chance of making a lot of money and having financial security versus losing the baby you nurtured over so many years is hard. It's really hard. This is a... It's an emotional business. It's a people's business. It's a talent business. We are drawn to all of those things, not just the money. As an aside, let me remind you of, of a comment that's always stuck with me, made by Roger Ames, to Guy Hans after his acquisition to, of EMI. Robbie Williams, one of the company's superstar artists at the time, had called Guy Hans a plantation owner. And when told this, Roger Ames shrugged his shoulders and said, the problem, guy, the assets you have acquired have opinions. Let's get back to the story. We knew PS had a future. We knew that what we had built was worth fighting for. We were utterly committed to making it work. So we made Michael a counter offer. Sell your shares back to us. And he did. And for that, I will always love him, because he didn't have to, but he did the right thing. So we found some new investors, put our own personal money on the table, and got our company back. It was wonderful. And I could easily end the story there with a short summary of how we all lived happily ever after. But life is not that simple. Having regained control of Pias, we had to face a lot of hard truth. For one thing, we were virtually bankrupt. The company was running on fumes and was a financial and structural mess. We had to fire a lot of good people, which was terrible. And we had to face up to the fact that we didn't have the managerial experience or expertise to run a company of that size. So, we had to work hard to achieve that. We were good bosses, but we were lousy managers. We put in place more efficient management structures, gave people new responsibilities, and empowered them to play to their own strength on behalf of the company. We stopped micromanaging and reacting to everything on an emotional basis. Well, at least we tried. If our German partners had taught us one thing, it was pragmatism. 
we learn to take the emotion out of commercial decisions and to start thinking like proper business people. That doesn't mean we stop being creative. Far from it. That has always been at the core of what we do and always will. But we learn to separate create creativity from business, and it was an important turning point for us. And slowly, slowly but surely, by learning from our mistakes, we turned things around. PS started to get back on track. We embraced the digital world and technology right from the very start and built a modern music company able to evolve with the quantum changes affecting the industry. We made pragmatic acquisitions, signed some wonderful artists on sensible deals, and slowly expanded our reach around the world so that today we have offices in 16 countries. An example of how we learned from our mistakes some of you may remember that last year we announced the acquisition of the legendary classical jazz and world music company, Hawanya Mundi. It was a leap into the unknown for both of us. We didn't have a huge amount of experience in these genres, and they weren't sure they wanted to work with a company so steeped in contempor contemporary music. It took us a long time to reach a deal with the guys at Hawanya Mundi. They quite rightly took a long, hard look at PS before deciding we were the right company to continue the legacy they had been building since 1958. For us, well, it was a deal entered with careful thought and pragmatism, evidence that both we and them are both wiser as a result of our past experiences. We will always be grateful to the labels and artists who supported us, to the staff who stayed loyal, and to the independent community in general who have proved in recent years that they are the future. So let me leave you with this thought. Don't have regrets. Always think big. But never be afraid to confront your mistakes, to admit you are wrong, and to learn lessons from the past. That is not a weakness. It is a strength. Thank you very much. <laughs>